So right now, as we get into God's word, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, continue to come and minister to us right now. Bring a revelation of what you, your heart is for us and what you want us to partner with you on. This is all about you, Jesus, and we're trusting you in what you are doing. Just open us to your heart in this, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the fourth and final in the series on Kingdom Disciples, Discipleship. This might be my favorite, and I'll tell you why. Because we talked about what a disciple is. But we also talked about how Jesus made disciples and how we can model that and do that as he modeled it for us, I should say. We also talked about how the disciples made disciples. But a lot of us have a kind of an inferiority complex. Well, I'm not like Jesus. I'm not as good as Jesus. I'm not as good as the apostles and the disciples. I'm not as anointed. You know, we make excuses, even though none of that is right. Because we have a spirit living in us. And Jesus said, you will not only do what I do, but you will do more than what I do. So, but what's special about today is there's no excuses with what we're going to talk about. Because we're going to talk about the average person. And if you look at yourself as an average person, which you are not, but sometimes self-perception is what it is, there's nothing we can't do that the early church did in making disciples oh, to, and encouraging one another. So today, it's about kingdom family. Discipleship through family. And we'll talk about that. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus told them, all authority has been given to me, and now I'm giving it to you. Therefore, go and make disciples in my authority of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I taught you. And I will be with you through the process to the very end of the age. That's what Jesus spoke over them. That's what he's speaking over us. So today, how did the church, the average Joe, the average person in the church make a disciple when they're to be a disciple themselves. When they're learning themselves. We know how Jesus made disciples, we know how the disciples made disciples, but how did the average person do it? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 2. We're going to be in the book of Acts today. Basically the first, uh, well chapters 2, 3, and 4 we're going to touch on today. So if you have your Bibles, your tablets, uh, phones, whatever, you can go to Acts chapter 2. We'll begin there. And beginning 37, verse 37 to 47. For those that don't know, the book of Acts was written by Luke, who wrote the book of Luke. And, he, and the book of Luke and the book of Acts... They were basically a letter to a, a high-ranking person named Theophilus. So what Luke was doing was giving a detailed account of what was taking place, or what took place in the life of Jesus and in the life of the disciples after Jesus left, giving, them, giving Theophilus basically the full gospel of what happened. And Luke, as we know, was a doctor, so he was very detail-oriented. That's why out of all the Gospels, his is the most detailed. So we, we, begin, we begin today in Luke, I mean, Acts chapter 2, verses 37, and he says, When they heard this, this is now Holy Spirit came, and Peter began preaching in Jerusalem. 
to the people who were stopping on the street wondering what in the world is happening to in this upper room here where these Galileans are all of a sudden speaking in languages they never knew before because the Holy Spirit hit them and the different people from different places were understanding them and things were happening. So, now when they heard this, this is the people now, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? So they heard the gospel message and now they're saying, what, what can we do? What can we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see what just happened? In our modern church, we tend to separate. Uh, can I ask the kids to lower their voice a little bit? Thank you. We tend to separate accepting Jesus from the Holy Spirit. That I accept Jesus, and then I accept the Holy Spirit. When the early church didn't do it that way. Accept Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. Somehow we, we kind of got it confused in a way. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words... He solemnly testified and kept exhorting or encouraging them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, verse 41, those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all. As anyone might have need, day by day, Continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. So let's paint the picture here. Peter preached the gospel of Jesus. Three thousand people received his words. So let me I'm going to define this to you. The word receive, the Greek word for receive means to accept gladly, to welcome. In other words, they were starving for something and they got just what they needed. I and it's personal. I receive, I welcome, I entertain. I embrace. These are the usages of this Greek word. So 3,000 people had Holy Spirit open their spiritual eyes and realize, man, I've been hungry for this, but I've been trying to satisfy it with other means. So they received it. It's what they needed, but they didn't realize they needed it. There's a lot of stuff if you're uh, if you're scrolling Facebook and Twitter and you see a lot of little things that come up and then the caption is I didn't know I need this till I saw it or I didn't know I need this in my life. Well, they didn't realize what would satisfy them till they finally got the right food. Have you ever like been hard hungry? And you ate like the entire fridge and nothing is satisfying you. You're still like, what is my body needing? And then finally you find that right thing.
that just evokes a chemical reaction in your body that just satisfies whatever it is you were craving, that's exactly what was happening in the spirit. They heard and received exactly what their spiritual life needed. And I love this. He says 3,000 souls received. He didn't say 3,000 people received. There's a difference. He didn't say 3,000 people. He said souls. What is your soul? Your mind, the way you think, your will, what drives you, and your emotions, your feelings. So 3,000 people connected with the heart of God in their mind, in their hearts, and in their emotions. Because you can have people say, yeah, this is fun, I'll come. This sounds cool. Yeah, I kind of think that's, I agree with that. Or you can have someone say, this is what I need, this is what I want, and embrace it. So you have 3,000 people who truly embraced it and connected to what he was saying. Holy Spirit connected them with their mind, their will, and their emotions. So they were connected to God. Hundred penny, hundred and twenty disciples were in that upper room. Suddenly, they were increased by three thousand. Suddenly, there was three thousand one hundred and twenty people who fully embraced what God wanted to do in their life. And as we've been talking about, discipleship is a two-way street. You've got to be willing to be discipled, and you have to be willing. To be one who disciples. So I want to talk about the willing first. The person who wants to be disciples in this context of kingdom family. Verse 42 of what we just read says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. The word continually means constant. Constantly attending to, pursuing, persisting in, persevering in, steadfast in. So they were, it was something they were determined to do. It wasn't like, ah, do I feel like going to Bible study tonight or not? It's, I wake up in the morning, I can't wait, and my day is planned around it. It's not an afterthought. They were continually driven. Obviously, they had lives, they had families, they had, they had to work, they had things going on, but it was a priority in their life to do this. Not an afterthought. Literally, two-thirds of every church, for the most part, the gathering is an afterthought. Two-thirds, if not more. Back in the 80s, Barna, which is an independent study room, they said the average churchgoer would attend, on, on average, three to four services a month. And back in the 80s, the big thing was Sunday night services, too. So they'd go Sunday nights, too. Now, in this generation, in our, this time, most churches no longer do Sunday night services. The average church person gathers with the body one to two times a month. That's how far it's dropped. What are we lacking? That steadfastness, that continuum where we're passionate that, about being together and fellowshipping together and growing together. There's not that uh, passionate desire to do so like it was then. They were continually devoted to one, the apostles' teachings. The gospel of Jesus. They wanted to know. They were hungry for the word of God. So Father, right now, if there's any one of us in this room, young and old, if we are not hungry, if we are not starving for your word, please, Lord, give us that hunger. Give us that hunger right now, Lord. Give us that hunger. Give me that hunger. Give each person in this room the hunger for more of your word. That when we read your word, it pops out of that page 
and speaks to us. And we're receiving not some of it. We're not picking and choosing, but we are hungry for that entire plate. We're not, not eating our vegetables. We're eating the whole plate that's placed in front of us. Give us that hunger. Two, they were devoted to fellowship. Definition of fellowship? It's not a social party. It's not a social environment. This what word fellowship has been watered down in our American definition of it. The word fellowship in the Bible is partnership, participation, sharing in, communion with, spiritual fellowship. There is a notation here that we are fellowshipping in the Holy Spirit, not apart from the Holy Spirit. We need to redefine that when we are fellowshipping, quote, apart from the Holy Spirit, it's not called fellowship, it's called a party, a get-together. To have true fellowship, Holy Spirit has to be there. Has to be. You know what happened in the early church? And some of you remember me sharing this a while back, a few years ago. Bible talks about it, and I want to read this to you real quick here. Ephesians 5.19. He says, Paul writes, Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, songs in the Spirit, and, and sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. You know what that's referring to? That's referring to their church gatherings. In the New Testament, they did not have a building to house 3,000 people. There were no mega churches when all of a sudden there was 3,120 devoted followers of Jesus. You know what they did? They had home churches. And you know what happened in those home churches? When you show up to a gathering in a home church on a Monday night, Friday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, whatever it was, you broke, you had a meal together. And then you began to worship. And there was no one cold pastor doing everything and telling everybody what to do. You know what they did? Exactly what we're doing this morning. If you have a word from the Lord, you get up and you say, if you have a spiritual song, you sang it. If you have uh, uh, something that God, a testimony that God did in your life, you release it. They were fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. He was stirring. He was moving within their gathering. So they did what Jesus did. And we'll get into that more, breaking bread. But then they also worshipped and just let Holy Spirit loose. And there was freedom. It wasn't one person at an altar releasing everything. That's what the church did. They came together, and it was just open worship. And whatever happened, happened in the spirit. That's fellowship. Third thing is they were devoted to breaking bread. Now, they were eating together, sharing meals together, spending time together. How hard is it to, to go out with somebody, have a cup of coffee, and pray together? And it, it encourage each other with the word of God. And, and, and we just ask the Holy Spirit, how can I encourage my brother or sister here? How hard is it to invite somebody to a meal in your home and just hang out with them? Or, go for, or if you like to walk at Homedale Park, invite somebody to go to walk with you. And then break bread together somehow. Grab a cup of coffee as you walk. They were spending time together. They were breaking bread together. See, in Arab culture, in Arab culture, you never go to somebody's house without bringing something with you. Even if they say, oh, come for dinner, don't bring anything, we got everything, you still bring it. It's a cultural thing. So you bring something with you to share, but you also bring the Spirit of God in you to share. So you share what's inside you and what you physically bring with you. 
So they were breaking bread together and they were sharing and, and they had communion together too. And then number four, the fourth thing they did is they devoted to prayer. And here's the thing, the word prayer here is not singular, it's plural, it's prayers. So they prayed, they prayed. What is prayer? It's seeking the heart of God in our lives. It's connecting and being in unity in one accord with the heart of God, the spirit of God. It's praying, praying is being in agreement with what God wants to do. This is what they were doing. And this was done in these house churches. Because all of a sudden, literally, in one day, 3,000 people. There's no way you can build a building to host 3,000 people in one day. So this is what they did. Now, what are some attributes of a discipling kingdom family? Again, this is the average person. This is not Paul. This is not the 12 apostles. This is not even the, the um, seven guys they elected to help take care of the people. This is the average person. This is what the average family, this is what they were doing to encourage one another. Because one thing you don't want to happen is when you experience Christ, to just go on in motion and have an emotional experience. If you're walking out of church in an emotional experience, you missed something. Because emotions will wear off. Things of the spirit, things of the word of God, things of the person of Jesus in your life last forever. Emotions will wear off heart of God lasts forever. So what was happening? Well, let's go to verse 43. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all. As anyone might have need, Day by day, again, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to the number day by day those who were saved. So, I have eight things I want to kind of talk about. In a, I'll try not to be long-winded about them. Real quick here. What are the characteristics of this? Of a kingdom family discipling? First thing is signs and wonders are taking place. You cannot have the Spirit of God show up and nothing happen. If you walk away, nothing happening. Or if you walk away with just head knowledge, I have to wonder if the Spirit of God showed up if the presence of God was there. You walk away and say, boy, this was a good service. I felt good about myself. <laughs> we missed the boat here. We cannot do that. This is why the presence of God is so important. Churches are dying because they're eliminating the presence and just want to educate you, what the Bible says. Well, I want to be educated in what the Bible says. But I can't follow through to, and do what the Bible says to do without the Spirit of God. Because then it's just my will and trying to be tough and tough it out. And what's going to happen? I'm not going to make it and will last. It has to be with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus in me. So the Holy Spirit was active at their gatherings. And when we gather, Holy Spirit should be there and active. If we don't, even on a Zoom Bible study or a Zoom call of ministry, Holy Spirit should still show up to break through and, and move and work. Acts 4.33 says, this, And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. 
Grace is a, the, the gifts of the Spirit are called grace gifts, charisma. So when we talk about grace in here, that, that abundant grace was upon Mark, it wasn't just the grace for the covering with the blood of Jesus for salvation, but it was the Holy Spirit, the gift of grace that comes through the Holy Spirit. His grace gifts. The power of God was flowing. Acts 5.12, at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all in one accord in Solomon's portico. What is Solomon's portico or Solomon's porch? Solomon's port, a porch or portico was a colonnade, or basically an area on the side of the temple that was big enough that when they would gather in a larger group, where there was five, six hundred people that might show up or more, it was big enough to host them versus a little home church. So occasionally they would meet there with the apostles because the apostles couldn't go to every single home group all the time. Think about it, 3,000 people. So when the apostles ministered, because also keep in mind, right now, they were still all Jews. 99% of these people were Jews. So they still went to the temple to worship. But now, they worship plus. They worship plus because they have Jesus. Acts 5, 14 through 16. And more, all the more believers in the Lord. Multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. So they continued. Something was stirring that the reality of the Spirit of God was drawing people in even more. How does that happen? Well, if I'm a drunkard, if I'm a drunk, foul-mouthed drunk, wasting my life away, and all of a sudden, I'm cleaned up, and I, I've got joy in my heart instead of cussing the world and walking in despair. And my attitude, shift in my attitude, in my spirit, and a smile on my face. And the presence of God flowing through me. Somebody's going to notice and wonder what the heck is going on. And if that can happen to you, why can't it happen to me? There's no bigger testimony than the evidence of your life being changed. No greater testimony. Because that's what reflects reality versus lip service. I can tell you about Jesus all I want. But what's going to touch you is you're going to see Jesus in you. That's what will make you change. To such extent that they even brought the sick to people. They brought the sick from the streets and laid them on cots and pallets. I'm continuing here. So that even when Peter came by, his shadow could heal them. And also the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits. And they were all being healed. Signs and wonders were taking place in their gatherings. Second thing, they were, they were together. They came together. They, and all those who believed were together and had thing, all things in common. They wanted to be with each other, as we talked about, encouraging and growing together. See, Hebrews 10.25 says, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you, as you see the day drawing near. Man, can you imagine that hunger to can't wait to come together because I can't wait to share with you what Jesus is doing? What Jesus has been speaking to me about? What I read in, my, in the word this morning that, man, I want to release to you and encourage you with? What I heard Holy Spirit say to me? What God did in my life? What a testimony? The guy that used to tick me off to no end, 
at my job that I just, that I used to always just tell off, all of a sudden, he's he's not bothering me like he used to. What a testimony! They couldn't wait to be together. So there was a, a regular flow of the Holy Spirit it was active and working. They were together. They made it a point to be together. Three, they had all things in common. There was unity among the believers. First time there was unity, Holy Spirit fell. And there, a consistency in the Word of God. Anytime we are together in a spirit of unity, the Holy Spirit shows up. It's, it never fails. When God's people are in one accord, Holy Spirit shows up. And then what's the result of that? Signs and wonders take place. It goes back to that first point. When we are together, we are stronger than, the, than as individuals. Much stronger. I, I could be pretty strong on my own. But when I'm with you, man, you encourage me. I encourage you. We are stronger. The Bible says... One can put a thousand to flight. Two can put what? Two thousand? No. Ten thousand. We are strong. Imagine what fifty can do when we're in one accord. Well, we know what 120 did with 3,000 people get saved and changed forever, marked forever. Acts 4.32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own, but all things were common property for one another. So let me explain that to you. It wasn't like all of a sudden that this became a commune where everybody sold their stuff and put it in a pot and it belonged to the leader. It wasn't that. What it was, which leads me to the fourth point, genuine love for each other is John 13 35 by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another there was such purity and genuineness of love for each other that they were willing to do whatever it took to help one another they sold their stuff to give away, not to put in a pot. They sold to give. The unity wasn't just in spirit, it began in the spirit, but it continued in the natural because the natural was a reflection of the unity of the heart in the spirit. If I know you needed something, you needed food, not only am I inviting you for dinner, I'm giving you something to take back with you. What were they doing? When the Holy Spirit's there, what do we do today? You know, most of you know me. Like, well, when I'm with you and I'm praying and asking, Lord, say, give them this. I'm going to be obedient to give you what God told me to give you. And many of you are like that too. When you hear Holy Spirit say, give so-and-so this thing or do this for them, you're going to be obedient to do it. Well, that's what they were doing. In one accord, they're listening to Holy Spirit. And when God says, go buy this person a, a bag of groceries, they went and bought them a bag of groceries. You got so much land, why don't you sell part, uh, part of that land and give so-and-so some money because he just lost his job? You're going to do that. They love each other. And see, there's a story in Acts 5, I'm not going to read the whole scripture, of Ananias and his wife Sapphira, who didn't sell everything, but sold part and then gave money to the disciples, but acted like they sold it all. And to make the long story short, they had the husband come in first without the wife. Hey, did you really do this? Yes, I saw we sold everything. And then he was struck dead by the Holy Spirit. Then the wife showed up. Did you guys sell everything? Yes. She was struck dead in the Holy Spirit. It wasn't because they kept it for themselves. It was because they were sowing 
discord in the spirit of unity. What, what keeps us in unity? It's the Holy Spirit. When you lie through the Holy Spirit, you begin to sow unity, uh, discord, and disrupt that spirit of unity that was flowing to the point where God needed to cut it. So it was their property. They could have done anything with what they wanted. They didn't even have to sell it. But the fact that there was deception in their heart that was causing division and dissension to what God was doing, he took them out. What does the Bible say? A little leaven ruins the dough. He was cutting that out. But they had genuine love for each other. They helped each other out as they need, as need arose. So signs and wonders took place. They were together. All things were in common. They had genuine love for each other. And they worshipped together. They worshipped together. They worshipped in the temple because they were Jewish. But they also worshipped in their home churches. And imagine what happens when we have that kind of a zeal to come together, bring in my fire with your fire, the fellowship of the spirit in the, in the spirit of unity. That sense of commitment goes a long way, guys. And if you're watching on Zoom and you've kind of relegated yourself to just watching on Zoom, you're missing a big part of what God wants to do in your life, what you have to offer. We're grateful you're a part of this worship, but we want to encourage you to come and join us and receive what God is fully doing here. They worshiped him. Then they also broke bread. Number six thing is they broke bread together. They ate and spent time. And we talked about this a little bit, but I want to touch on this thing. It says they broke bread together from house to house. So today we're going to have church in my house and just let the Spirit do His thing in my house. Tomorrow, come to my house. And they went to different homes and did this. They worked together. There was such a bond. They ate, spent time with gladness and sincerity of heart. I want to define this to you. Gladness, exaltation, exuberant joy. Again, imagine getting excited about going to be with somebody and, and seeing what God does, spending time together. Ecstatic, delight. The word sincerity here in Greek means simplicity and sincerity. So with gladness and sincerity of heart. So with exuberant joy and simplicity, it wasn't complicated. I bring food, you bring food. We start worshiping. Holy Spirit gives me something. I release it to you. Holy Spirit gives you something. You release it to me. We have fun with Jesus. It wasn't pre-thought out. You let Holy Spirit go. There was unity. Guess what? Every single one of us can do this in our homes. The worst thing we can do is say, well, you know, I'm not very eloquent, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a worship leader, I'm not this, I'm not that. You don't need to be anything but willing. Amen. Open your home, have somebody in there with you, or meet them somewhere, at a park or whatever. Two or more are gathered in my name. Jesus is there. All you need is at least one other person. The more the merrier. And just start and see what God does. See what Holy Spirit does. That's how you disciple. That's how you work together and you grow together. Then, it says, gladness and sincerity of heart. It doesn't mean just this. It means your character. It has to do with the character of your soul, your inner self, your intention, your purpose. You get together because you want to, and you want to connect. It's your desire. It's there from you for you. Simple. It's just that willingness. 
Seventh thing is, what were they doing? They were praising God. They were giving thanks and glorifying. It was pure worship. Again, I can't do this. I can't sing. I'm not this. I'm not. Well, you know what? Psalm 104 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. In words of praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. You start praising him, thanking him for what he did this day. You start worshiping him and just giving him glory for how he's taken care of you. You start giving him thanks for what he's going to do that hasn't been done yet. And you let Holy Spirit just kind of flow from there. They were praising God. Imagine being so thankful that you got exactly what you needed. I go back to that uh, metaphor of you know, you tear your kitchen apart looking for something to satisfy you, you ate the entire fridge and nothing says like your belly's full, but your craving is still there. And so you, your mind is telling you you're still hungry. But then when you find that thing, how thankful you are. It just, man, it's in me. I know for me, <laughs> when I want to, uh, something, I, I go crazy. A couple of years ago, I just needed a Whopper. I haven't had a Whopper in 15 years, but I just needed a Whopper. And a hamburger at home did not suffice. I needed a Whopper. And my craving did end until I broke down and actually went to get fast food, which I don't normally eat at all, and got a Whopper. And I was very thankful because now I don't have that craving anymore. It's the same thing. Praising God because what you need, you're getting. Right there in that. And finally, the eighth thing, they were having favor by all men. That's how their numbers grew. Because the evidence of God was in their lifestyle, was in the life they were living. They were not just having church and that was it. There was evidence of what God was doing in their lives. Our numbers will grow with the evidence of God in our lives. We talk about evidence of God in our lives, and some of us have that, but they didn't limit it to just the church. For some reason, the church has decided to seclude itself from the world. You know why politics is out of control? Do you know why the school systems are out of control and are anti-Bible? Because back in the Jesus movement in the late 60s and early 70s, there was this mentality among the church to be communal. So teach Christians who were teachers in the school systems went to work to, for Christian schools because they were of like-minded versus influencing the secular community. Politicians or who were Christians came out of politics to do other things within a Christian setting. People were moving away from being Christians in the world so that they will know us by our love and we're trying to be Christian to Christians. This is the result of why we're like this today. And I'm not making this up. This is a reality. This is a reality. This is what happened. So now what's, what's the church doing? We're trying to backtrack and bring Christianity into politics, bring Christianity into the, uh, the, the teachings of Jesus into the school system. We're not doing a very good job because we took out our influence in the real world, in the business world. But they were having favor because they were who they were no matter where they were. What, what is having favor? What's the definition, the Greek definition here? Is grace and kindness. A blessing brought to man by Jesus Christ. Gratitude. A grace as a gift. The evidence of love was on their lives. And the people outside the church recognized it and show kindness to them back because they were loving the people. You know, when you love somebody 
and, and it's real love or real kindness, you'll have favor with that person. They, might, they don't have to agree with you. You don't have to agree with them. But love is not about agreeing with politics or ideologies or what social norms. It's loving the human being because God loved them so much that he sent his son for them. When you love and you genuinely care, favor will be returned to you. God's hand will be on you. See, God is love. God will not be where I am not loving. If I'm not loving, his hand won't be on it. If I'm not releasing his love, again, I don't have to agree, but I'm loving the individual. And I'm praying for the individual. And I'm showing kindness to the individual. When I do that, I'm releasing the spirit of God in me to make a difference, to bring about change. They didn't hide from the world, but revealed God's love to the world in their lives. And what was the result? The very last statement of this scripture. When we do this, when we as a kingdom family are doing this, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who are being saved. When we do this, he will add to our number day by day. Day by day, there will be an increase. Day by day, there will be more. Day by day, there will be change. There will be influence. It might take weeks, it might take days, it might take months to, to influence the person. It might take even years. But you don't know the depth of God's love in your hearts. You might be loving on and showing kindness and reflecting Jesus to somebody for years and they move away or somehow leave your life. But you don't know the depth of God's love in their lives. We had, I'm going to close with this. We had a few years ago a family who were Mormons come to us. Uh, they were, my wife was doing was working on doing some online work, and the wife was kind of the director of the program my wife was in. I didn't know they were Mormons. Well, they were going on vacation that summer. This was two years ago, three years ago. And they had a huge trailer. They were going up and down the East Coast and around the states. So they came and stayed with us for two days. Amanda was there. You met them at the beach that day, that Friday night for one of the beach concerts. Well, again, I didn't know anything about them. My wife chose not to tell me. We chose to treat them as if we were treating everybody else no different. We loved on them. We prayed as if they are part of our church. We prayed with them, for them, whatever. We did everything. The Lord told us specific things to release to them and to physically give them. I gave, the Lord told me to give a guitar to their middle daughter. Well, we found out months later that they went back, they're from the Midwest, Iowa, I think they moved to. They're going to a Christian church now. And the wife actually wrote my wife and told them, we've never seen anything like that before what happened when we were at your house. It changed our life. And their one middle daughter who was struggling with depression and identity issues, God began to shift in her life too that I gave the guitar to. And I had no idea about any of this. This is all after the fact, but it didn't matter. You'll love them the same. You don't stop being who you are based on your environment. Amen. Stand with me. I'm going to show up now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Get in that position to receive.
the order of what's Hey, maybe can you come and just kind of pick your guitar a little bit? You don't even have to plug it in, just pick it. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing. We just thank you for what you're doing right now. As our hearts are just tuning to you, Lord. And I pray, Father, that the last four weeks, that you stirred something new in every single one of us that we never had stirred before. And that we are encouraged and motivated for the more to be discipled and to disciple, to love, to, to go beyond ourselves. As a church, we repent for not doing everything we're supposed to do. As a person, I repent for not doing my part, Lord. So Holy Spirit, encourage us and empower us. I want to release in the name of Jesus godly vision on how this works for you, how this will work for you in your life. What this could look like. Whether it's discipling as Jesus did, as the disciples did, or as a kingdom family, it doesn't matter. Or being discipled. That you would release that, Father, that we would see a change in this church family that we can have the same testimony that day by day you added numbers to us. Week by week, gathering by gathering, home group by home group, you are adding numbers, person by person, to this family. We just thank you, Jesus, and I pray the same for those that are watching online right now. We just thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. Be our strength through this process. Encourage us that we can encourage others. In Jesus' name. Before I close, I feel like somebody has something. I uh, received a healing today. And um, boy, shame on me for being so used to receiving healing that I forgot to give God glory. <laughs> I, when we came in this morning, I felt very nauseous, terribly nauseous. Like, I thought I was going to have to get sick, kind of nauseous. And my sisters uh, prayed over me, and the nausea went away. It didn't take but more than a couple minutes. And I give God all the glory. Thank you for my healing this morning, Lord. Father, I think we're going to, it looks like we're going to be able to maybe start out over at the keyboard thing today and see how far it goes. And Lord, I just ask that you bless every single one of us that goes there, that you have create divine appointments for us, and that we, you highlight not just people, but how to pray. And when we open our mouth, that your Holy, your Spirit would just speak through us to know how to just love our people, not forcing anything on them, but just loving them and being kind. Just simply being kind. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in his love.